two weeks, uh, now he's training the A's. But then you have a slider, so you don't have a slider, so I have a single step, low temperature growth, of high mobility, larger area graphene, and tensile application. And I know that graphene is going to solve all the world's problems for, for high efficiency and low power, so uh, that should be good. And then uh, Jimmy Zhang, energy efficient Wi Fi displays. And then John Clampton, the other new professor in UC Ely this year, will uh, uh, talk September 3rd. So he's coming back, 4 o'clock on the usual Thursdays. Uh, so, uh, but today we're pleased to have uh, Clint Chow. I think everyone may know Clint from when he used to be in Santa Barbara to Julity, but he got his degree from uh, University of Texas. Who was your advisor? Joe Campbell. Joe Campbell. Yeah. Okay. Or Joe went off to Virginia. Um, and uh, went to IBM, and he's been very famous uh, in terms of OSC, in terms of lots of papers and tutorials and chairs and things like that. So uh, there's no one better to speak about uh, photonics in the next gener generation data center. So, Clint. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. I don't know if I deserve all those nice words, but um, I'm happy to be here to try and give you some perspective. This was actually a good time for me to start working on a talk. And this is the fourth time I've given this talk in the last kind of month and a half. But I've been at IBM for more than 10 years working on the field of interconnects and computing systems and really sort of moving towards more of a focus on data centers. So being new to UCSB, this was actually a good opportunity to sort of think about what I'd sort of learned and the perspective I gained at IBM, but also think about what are the areas that I think are the most um, promising to push on into the future. And so that's what I'll try and talk to you about today. So a quick outline, uh, just a, a background on, on what are the sort of interconnects and technologies that are used today. Uh, really, it's primarily point to point, and there are multiple technologies for multiple purposes. And that's sort of a statement that's probably going to continue for a long time. And then I really want to focus on two opportunities. And I think those are really in terms of photonic I.O., and I'll explain what I mean by that. And then also looking at doing more and more routing and switching in the photonic domain. And I think really the path forward for both of these opportunities is to get to a point where we don't just have electronic and photonic integration, but we have it at scale. Because I think to try and pull off the sorts of revolutionary components and technologies that we're going to need to build systems in the future, we're going to have to have that element of scale. And then just wrap up with some closing thoughts. So I don't know how much I need to go over this slide. It's really background on, on fiber optic communications. I made it about 10 years ago, and I didn't really modify it. Um, and I think that's interesting from one standpoint. So the point here was to try and contrast really the two camps that had existed for a long time. One was the telecommunications, where you're really dominated by the cost to install fiber. So nothing else really matters that much. Cost of transceivers is, is somewhat secondary. Performance is the primary objective. And then there was the datacom sort of application. And again, 10 years ago, this was sort of a, a clean divide. So Datacom was hundreds of meters. You would think about wiring Ethernet to your desk in a campus or, or something on that order. Really, data centers hadn't hit like they had now. And uh, some of these statements are still true, as multimode fiber still dominates, and the transceivers tend to be commodities. So since you're not installing over huge distances, you can afford to sort of upgrade things as you need to. Um, again, just introductory things. Time division multiplexing, that just means um, single optical channel, go as fast as you can with electrical mux, demux. Wavelength division multiplexing, put multiple colors or multiple channels of light down a fiber. Space division multiplexing, parallel optics. And something that it's good just to remind ourselves of, uh, again, in this audience, I don't know if I have to go through it, but the, the relative core size between single mode fiber and multimode fiber really explains a lot in terms of what technologies are used today. And also why uh, you might want to go to something that's, that's inherently kind of harder to build from an assembly standpoint, but has more future proofing built into it. So the interesting thing with data centers is it really falls right between this. So I think data centers really blurred this line. There's a lot of need for connectivity, but it's not necessarily the really long telecom stuff. And it's, it requires a lot longer, a lot, a lot higher number of longer links than the traditional datacom applications. So in terms of technologies, I'm really going to focus on two today. These are sort of uh, the, the current workhorse, which is vertical cavity sur surface emitting laser technology, coupled with multimode fiber. And again, I think that's very successful just because if you look at how easy it is to couple light into and out of a multimode fiber, it's a lot easier with a bigger core than it is with a smaller core, like uh, in single mode optics. 
And then I'm going to talk about silicon photonics, um, not because really conventional sort of indium phosphide single mode isn't playing a role or doesn't have a potential role, but I think more in the research community we see this as, as a path forward because of some attractive attributes that I'll talk about. So I called this slide the old days. Uh, at IBM, we used this slide for years, years and years and years, because it, it really tells an, a compelling story and it makes the case for why you work on connectivity and computer systems. And it's really just a chart of the performance of the supercomputers on the planet. So there's the number one machine, there's the, the total one to 500, and then there's the number 500 machine. And they really follow the same trend lines. So if you wanted to look at this and say, well, um, why, why do I need to have uh, more connectivity? Why do I need more bandwidth in systems? Well, it's because this march is going to be relentless. And at some point, probably in 2004 or early 2000s, this stopped being driven by just single core performance and processors and really became more about parallel systems. And that can be parallel um, multi-cores on a chip, multi-chips in a package, and then as you build out further and further into higher scale. So multiple um, processors uh, or servers in a rack and then multiple racks in a system. So this really just motivated the need for more bandwidth within systems. There were some things that sort of weren't quite right with this picture though. And the one was that really this trickle down theory that HPC would drive the development of the very highest performance components because they were needed to achieve this sort of number one machine level performance. And then those would just get be picked up by commercial servers. And I think the problem with that was really the HPC market is, is a very small market. It's basically one customer that ends up footing the bill for a machine, and that's the US government. And they might buy just a handful of machines. So as, as sort of a business model, it's not a very good market. Um, it, it did kind of work in some instances, and I'll, I'll show some examples. But the other part of this is that these trends, uh, I think if you talk to more of the supercomputing folks, this, this was really overly optimistic to think that we'd be at an exascale machine in the year 2020. I think this is significantly pushed out. And, and a lot of that is due to the connectivity that's required in trying to build a machine with the performance in terms of compute and communications in a power envelope that makes any kind of sense. These are tens of megawatts machines um, and, and very large scale installations. So the high water mark for HPC, which I think is just sort of interesting historically now that it's, I guess, almost five years old, was a machine that was called Blue Waters. It was supposed to be an IBM machine. Um, IBM actually yanked the contract, so they, they never really built the Blue Waters machine. But in its early days, it really caught a lot of people's attention because at scale, it could have two million pixels in a single system. And so this was really sort of a driver for thinking that ComputerCom, inter interconnects for computer systems, was going to be something that was really going to be a primary sort of mover in the field of optical interconnects. And when it was built, it was called the Power 775 machine, and it was sort of just an amazing tour de force. So I think it was the first time, and, and really kind of the only time, you've seen optics to the chip. And it doesn't look all that sort of compact as, as some of the research drawings that, that a lot of us come up with. But there's a switch chip module in here, and it's surrounded by 56 parallel multi-mode fiber uh, VXL-based transceivers. So it really brings a tremendous amount of bandwidth straight off of a chip package and um, does it at a scale that I think we haven't seen since. And that's sort of the problem, is this, this pushed everything to the limit. If you looked at the backplane in terms of wiring out all this fiber connectivity, um, it, here you can see the numbers, 1,500 fibers or cables per rack. These were the most dense optical ribbon cables that you could buy, so 48 channels. And if you looked at sort of the wiring trays that go into the system, it's, it's how much more can you really do here. This is a, really a tour de force in what could be done. It's, it's still, I think, close to the state of the art even a few years later. But it really sort of highlighted the needs, even in HPC systems, for more bandwidth per fiber. And that really, I think, translates into to WBM. I won't really go into multi-core fiber much. And so it's still true. That was a few years later. This was the number one machine. Again, some of these, these slides are a little bit IBM-centric because uh, that, that happens to be where I, I could get my hands on, on nice pictures. Um, but this is the Blue Gene Q family of machines. This one's a Sequoia system. And again, just a staggering number of optics that support this supercomputer. So there's 620,000 lasers in this system, or 620,000 fibers, however you want to kind of count it. But the interesting thing about, and, and really the defining aspect of this market, is if you've seen a supercomputer, you've sort of seen every supercomputer. These things aren't all that interesting to see. But the, the, the thing that's funny is they, they fit in a machine room, they go in a big room, and it's just a bunch of racks, and it's sort of 
the size of, of a big room. So when you think about what do I really need to connect this, I really only need technologies that are about 50 meters long. And most of the things you need to connect are, are really on the order of 10 meters. So it's, it's fundamentally more of a short reach emphasis for HPC. And in that space, um, Vixels actually do extremely well. These are some of the, the most recent results, or maybe a couple years old now, um, that we, we did at IBM. This was a full 32 nanometer CMOS driven link. And what we plot is the power efficiency in picojoules per bit, so how much it costs us to transmit a bit in energy as a function of the data rate. And this is for the full link. And so at 25 gig, we were able to get this down to a wall plug efficiency. So sort of no tricks, just whatever comes out of the, the wall and into the circuit of a picojoule per bit at 25 gigabits per second. So it can be very fast and very uh, efficient in terms of deploying these pixels. And the thing I'd like to highlight a little bit, because I think this is something that I, I don't, I think it was an interesting topic that we explored at IBM, but I don't think it was done. Um, I think there's a lot more to be done in this field. And that was really trying to look at rethinking equalization. And when I'm saying equalization, I'm really sort of meaning not, not just equalization in the normal sense of you think about trying to compensate for a, a communications channel, but really thinking about trying to optimize the entire system so that if you think about what an optical link is doing, it's trying to transmit bits, electrical bits, from input to output. And so we thought about this and, and really took another look at equalization and, and through really a simple sort of approach, just doing relatively easy pre-emphasis, we sort of tried to pre-compensate not really the fiber, which is again, conventional equalization. You, you sort of think about um, fixing up a transmission line or an electrical trace or some kind of a, an interconnect channel but looked at the channel as a much more broadly defined sort of black box where we could equalize the response of the laser, some, somewhat the channel itself, the fiber, and then also the circuitry and the devices themselves in the receiver, which is really sort of the, the fundamental fight we were having in building high performance links. So we first did this in CMOS, it was dramatically successful. So this is a 15 gigabit link, again full link, so this is the output of the receiver after receiving um, the optical bits and converting them to a, an electrical digital bit at 15 and 20 gigabits per second. At 20 gigabits, the, the eye is just completely dead and closed, and we open it right back up at 20. And what this did was not only sort of increased our rate capability, but even at lower data rates, we got more power efficient links. So again, this is power efficiency versus data rate. And so this was really a big win. It was not only more speed, but it was more speed and more efficiency, which is really a difficult thing to, to usually pull off. And so after that, we ported it to silicon germanium technology and did the first 40 gigabit per second Vixel links. Um, and again, this is just an example, no equalization. With equalization, you can sort of really open up the, the communications channel and, and make it work very reliably. And the latest result this year was at 71 gigabits per second. And this is sort of my last Vixel slide, and I think the work to be done here, I don't think this has really been done, at least to the level of full link optimization in the context of silicon photonics. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to try and look at that and to say, how can I actually de divide, design both my circuits as well as my photonic devices to not just make a, an open transmitter eye or make a, a, a receiver that works well with a reference transmitter, but to consider it as a complete system and make it uh, work much, much better by doing a co-design of the two components. So I, I, I like this picture, obviously. Um, it's beautiful here. So what happened in terms of HPC driving the whole industry? Um, really, the cloud sort of rolled in and took over. And particularly coming from IBM, this was a little bit of a, a shock. Um, and maybe that's more of a business statement. I think that's nothing that um, is, is earth shattering if you follow the headlines. But sort of cloud computing really became important. And it sort of took a lot of people by surprise to some degree. But if you look at the growth that's projected in terms of data center traffic, so this is, Cisco publishes this nice um, study every year looking out for the next five years in terms of what they expect to be the, the growth. So this is total data center IP traffic, 23% compound annual growth rate. But if you look at where that's broken down, it's really cloud as the growth market. So traditional data center, and I think traditional data center also means enterprise. This means the, the sort of normal IT that we were all used to before the cloud sort of started encroaching upon it. So this is a 8% market, cloud is 32%. So, so where are you really gonna try and um, look for opportunities in terms of driving technology? It's, it's really the cloud. And then the other statistic that gets 
thrown around a lot is that the traffic is really within the data center. Um, the, the way we used to construct data centers is really not suited for the way that they're used, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. But really, most of the traffic is going machine to machine in data centers and not going from, say, a user outside the data center to a server and, and back out. Microsoft gave some good talks at, at our sort of um, leading industry conference at OFC in 2014, and they, they for one, just kind of showed these, these growth stories, which are, are really staggering. I think Microsoft's heavily invested in the cloud, and, and their business is doing actually very well. But they looked at sort of the, the footprint of global data centers that, that they have around the world, and the compute instances that went up from hundreds of thousands to millions, and corresponding increase in, in the bandwidth that's being shipped around in these installations. And the next thing I'll show is sort of how they wired this, but I wanted to put, insert one slide that's sort of a, a generic picture, which is, it, it's good for purposes of visualization. I think some of these networks are evolving to where this isn't 100% true anymore. But if you look at traditional hierarchical networks, they're sort of arranged in these sort of fat tree or folded uh, cloth architectures. So you have a bunch of servers that are connected through one layer of switching, and then you sort of aggregate to higher levels of switching to, to address more and more servers. And it's, it's good for how it sort of evolved, which was for, for so-called north-south traffic, traversing the data center in this direction. But now, when really most of the, the traffic is machine to machine and going east to west, it really is poorly supported by these architectures. So keep that in mind. Uh, one more kind of slide just to, to frame what the next slide will show. And that's, how do, what does a data center look like? Well, I think it looks a lot like a supercomputer, just bigger. It's just a bunch of racks. So within the rack, you usually have a lot of servers. They're connected through that first level of switching, which is often called a TOR or top of rack switch. And then you have a lot of racks. So the lot of racks basically are the, uh, connected through that hierarchy of switches that let all the servers interconnect with each other through that hierarchical tree. So this is how Microsoft builds their data centers. Um, and it really is sort of, th this is their drawing. This is my crude little cartoon. Um, but it's, it's the same if you look at it. I think they call it you know, top of rack and then leaf switches, spine switches. But if you look at what's deployed, uh, sort of the biggest number is link quantity, server to top of rack. There's tens of thousands of these in, in one of their data centers. And if you're a photonics person, this is always kind of disappointing because this isn't optics. This is twin axe. This is a twisted pair wire that goes between the server and the top of rack switch. When you come to the top of rack to leaf, this now becomes active optical cable. This is multi-mode, pixel-based photonics, sort of what I showed you in, in HPC. And then really beyond that is where you start seeing the needs for single-mode fiber and where the advantages of single-mode fiber, particularly in terms of future WDM compatibility, is, is what's compelling and what drives these big data center operators to really go single mode. Um, he also made this statement, which I, I think is funny, but no one seems to laugh when I say it, but it, it says WDM is really identified, it's a, it's a much lower cost, um, it's a path to lower cost data centers if the transceivers are cheap. And it's just like saying, well, anything is cheap if it's cheap. But I think they see it more from an operational standpoint that says, if I can get to the point where I can easily put multiple wavelengths on a fiber, that does me a lot of favors in terms of numbers of fibers, numbers of connectors, and just managing the data center infrastructure. So I won't go through this. I just ripped this off of the web. Um, these are the largest data centers. The, the punchline is, is they're huge. They're just absolutely massive. Um, and you, you, know, you can sort of see names that you, that you might recognize. This, the scariest one is number four to me. This is the NSA facility, um, which I'm even saying on videotape, which is even doubly bad. But uh, these, these huge facilities, obviously, if you want to communicate across them, it's not an HPC 50 meter problem anymore. It's becoming a kilometer problem. And so again, that's another big driver for why we need to have efficient WDM single mode optics. So how do we get to more connected data centers? If we, if we, we know that the problem is we can't connect east-west as well as we'd like to, and we want to kind of change that game, what can we do? And this, again, is just a, sort of a, a simple formula for if you want to know how many, um, how many nodes can get connected in a given number of hierarchical levels, depending on the number of switch ports that are available in your actual sort of switching element. And the numbers are a little bit funny, so they're, they're hard to compare column to column. The ones I highlighted were just ones that happened to come out to be the same. So in this case, if you could have a switch that had 64 ports instead of 16 ports, 
you would crush two levels of hierarchy. So you would have a much flatter data center. And for one server to talk to the other, they wouldn't have to ping up through as many levels and back down. So you'd win on both sort of throughput as well as latency in terms of having a shorter path. So that's what I would call here flatten the network. And, and the, the easiest way to do this is this chart. Basically, if you can build switches with a lot more ports, you don't need as many levels of hierarchy to connect a given number of servers. These could be electrical or optical cores. Um, usually, it's, I think, more thought of in terms of, uh, of op uh, electrical cores. And then the other aspect uh, that I'll talk a little bit more about is to really sort of change the network. And by that, adding an optical circuit switching layer. So where now you, you still have maybe your conventional electrical packet switch, but you have uh, an additional sort of transport medium that can bypass that. Okay, so the two areas I wanted to highlight. One, I'm calling photonic I.O. Uh, you could think of it as optics to the chip. Question. Yes, sir. That's this. That's this drawing. So it's a class. It's a folded class. Yeah. So t today, we have really electrical chip packaging that's driven by electrical chips. And th that sounds kind of funny, too. But really, the expensive thing here is this piece of silicon. The package um, is really sort of designed to, to get everything out uh, in terms of signals as cheaply as possible so that you can put this on relatively low-cost motherboards that you can buy for really high-end servers versus um, what you would even have for a desktop machine aren't dr that dramatically different. So they're connected with ball grid arrays or L grid arrays. That's this array of, of connections at the bottom. Um, they're very coarse, so the state of the art or, or what you can buy has been about 0.8 or 1 millimeter pitch for as long as I can remember, for about the last 10 years or so. And so it really has very poor scalability from a signal integrity standpoint. You can think of these things, they're, they're relatively large, so when you're driving a high-speed signal through it, that's sort of naturally a barrier. And uh, we're starting to see that they're really limiting, the, the packaging is limiting the system performance and reducing the efficiency. Um, so I think in the field of, of photonics, we always sort of draw the same pictures. And, and it's easy to draw is, is you sort of start with some kind of a multi-chip package. It's maybe connected to the outside world through the same kind of cheap electrical technology that exists today. There can be one or more ICs. Those could be 3D stacks if you want. There can be, and then you surround it if this is a photonically connected module by high density, ultra low power photonics. And I'll tell you why they have to be both of those things. And then maybe you have an interposer if you need it. If, if the connectivity of these modules, which, which actually at, at sort of the top level where chips are attached is very high. These, these are actually very high performance chip packages. It's really the bottom that limits you. Um, but if this is really going to happen, you can't just add photonics. It basically has to do more for you. You have to put in the photonics, and it must give you more bandwidth at better efficiency. Or otherwise, there's really no compelling reason to do it. So I'm going to sort of put this argument in the context of electrical switches. Uh, you can make the same arguments for processors, but I think switches are interesting because they're really the point in the system where most of the bandwidth is concentrated, and so it's sort of a natural place to look at what optics can do for you. And one of the things to remember is, is really that we're limited in terms of what electrical switches offer. So I just pulled these again off the web. This is Mellanox, a major switch vendor, and, and Broadcom. And the ones I want to highlight, basically, the, the power, you can think of it as sort of 100 to 150 watts. And that's really just limited by chip cooling. But the interesting thing is you're also limited in ports. So this is a 36-port InfiniBand switch. The, the Ethernet version is 32 ports. This is a monster of a chip, 7 billion transistors, but it's still 32 ports. These are logical ports. So this is actually four 25-gig ports. Um, the real number is about 128. This is how much you can get off an electrical chip today. And it's not a chip, it's really not a chip statement. I, I got this, um, I, I could just redraw it because it's not all that complicated, but from Michael Lohr from Compass Networks. And it's just a nice way to sort of visualize the problem. The problem isn't building a chip with enough connectivity. The problem is getting those signals off of these cheap packages. And by cheap, they're still very high performance, but they also are, are designed so that you can actually afford to use them in systems. And so if you look at how things are wired, these are differential pairs coming off. Um, each one of these is an interconnect. And they can sort of only go uh, several rows deep in terms of pins. 
And it's not even really a statement of this package. It's, it's really a statement of the, the host I.O., or uh, sorry, the host uh, circuit board that this is going to get attached to, be that an LGA or, or a BGA package that goes on there. It's really the wiring and the pitch that's supported by the rest of the system. And this is another way to say that. Um, this was worked by a colleague at IBM. But basically, if you just looked at the supported bandwidth coming off of a chip, at, at the C4, the, the, the flip chip sort of pad, metallurgy, you have a very high bandwidth. The chip carriers themselves, again, very, very high performance. This is where you get hit, is, is going through that connector. Um, and then the PCB, you can have a lot more layers, so you can sort of bump that number back up. But it doesn't really matter. Is this, this is your bottleneck in the system, is, is pushing electrical data through that relatively coarse package. So there's really a, a fundamentally sort of a bandwidth density argument to be had for integrating things on first level chip packages. There's also a power argument. So um, there's actually, if, if you do go to OFC, there's a short course um, by, uh, again, an old colleague that's, that's brilliant. You should take the course. But the, I stole this from him, but it's, it's basically showing that if you want to transport electrical bits from one chip to the other today, you live in a really terrible world as an electrical I.O. circuit designer. Um, and I, this isn't too surprising. I think most of us have probably heard that. But if you think about getting off the chip, you have to go through a package which has a connector, and then you go through a trace, and then maybe another connector, and then a backplane trace. So you have to go through just a bunch of stuff to get to the, the next chip. And what that means is if you plot the loss of the channel, this is the real reason people look at more conventional equalization and think of equalization more in terms of equalizing channels, because the electrical interconnects, the electrical channels are so bad that you really have to do something. So there's heavy equalization in terms of feed-forward equalizers in the transmitter and decision feedback equalizers in the receiver just to compensate for this. Or otherwise, you put in a nice um, input I and out comes garbage. And I don't think I have the, the after. That's sort of the before picture. but. With all this equalization, you can actually equalize these channels and do some amazing things. But it costs you power. So the idea is you don't want to burn power to get to optics that's located very, very far away. And you don't have enough bandwidth to really drive enough signals off of your chips to make them very connected. So what's the natural thing to do? You want to move from these bulky sort of standalone modules to very highly integrated solution. And again, this is the sort of drawing that that's just widely, um, I think everybody sort of draws this. But the challenge is, is when you do this, you're really pushing that photonics into the sort of the, the worst possible or the most constrained place it could be. It's, it's the most expensive. It's the most thermally challenged. It's got problems in terms of power delivery. And so it's not just a technological problem to do this. Or, or if it is a technological problem, it's not a photonics problem, but really an overall IC design um, packaging, photonics, to make the whole system make some sense. I'm not going to go through this in detail. This is actually, um, part of these slides came from a tutorial, so it's meant to just provide somewhat of a reference uh, for the user or the, the, the viewer to go back and, and look for later. But Luxterra has been given a lot of nice talks over the years, and I got this from Peter. But they basically have analyzed, this is how we do things today. This is sort of the cartoon I drew in the last slide. You have bulky modules at the edge of a card. In the future, we could embed those. So now, instead of going all the way to the edge of a card, we go off the package still and go sort of close by. And in the future, we could have optics right on a chip module. Again, that sort of cartoon of having high performance optics and, and electronics uh, co-located on a, the first level package. And if you do this, this is their projection for, for what you would save in power. And it seems pretty reasonable, I, I think, in, in terms of uh, the actual numbers they come up with. But it's, it's pretty impressive. Where you really start saving power is, did I lose the legend? No, OK, optical I.O. Is, is the yellow. The serializer is the green. And so what you're, you're really gaining by going onto a highly integrated solution in terms of pulling the photonics on the chip module is you get rid of this extra stuff, which is the module I.O. and the host I.O. So these are those electrically um, equalized sort of heavyweight cores that have to talk to each other. And so once you've stripped all that out, then really you're, you're paying sort of the minimum price. You, you have to sort of have the logic on the chip, and you have to have the, the photonic transport, but you've eliminated all of the middle sort of uh, middlemen that are costing you power. Um, Oracle has, has worked on this quite a bit. They have this concept of a, a macro chip, and, and this is even a little bit more aggressive than the normal sort of cartoon. But they, they have multiple sites, and they're all connected through this um, WDM network. 
I really mention this because it again, I think, hammers home that point. If you, this is a, again from, from Oracle, from Ashok. Uh, this, this shows sort of all of the things that you would have to do to make these kinds of technologies a reality. So it's, it's really not just a photonics problem. It's not an electronics problem. It's, it's, a, it's kind of the entire system problem. That means you have to do electronic and photonic co-design. They've sort of shown it in the VLSI chip and photonic chips. You have to figure out how to package these things together. And then really, I think, there has to be some kind of a really compelling reason to do this. There has to be some pull from the system level that says, this is going to make me build a system that's going to perform better so that I can sell it and go make some money. Otherwise, you just don't do this because it's, it's an interesting technological challenge. Um, some work that uh, we did at IBM with, with Arion, um, this was a couple years ago. And, and the point I wanted to make here was really to try and Again, rethink about how things are put together and go to a next level of integration. So now if you look at how, this is a, a, an EAM link. So it's basically uh, an electroabsorption modulator um, with a driver circuit talking to a, a photodiode connected to a receiver circuit. And the products that you can buy today are really all based on 50 ohm systems. So there's 50 ohms terminations in the drivers, there's 50 ohm transmission lines, there's 50 ohm terminations at the, the EA device and the photonics. And you really just end up burning a lot of power and, and wasting a lot of energy living in this 50 ohm world where what we really have to do is get to the level where we're just directly integrating things. So sort of the punchline here that made this interesting work was design the driver so that it directly drives the, the modulator. And that's not just a, a, a statement in terms of circuit design, but that basically means to, to make that a reality that you're directly driving something means that the packaging has to support that. It basically has to have a packaging implication that you're putting the things so closely together that you don't need a 50 ohm transmission line. I mean, these things serve a purpose. They're, they're there because that's the way um, transceivers and modules are built today. Um, and this is, again, I think just another slide to highlight that point. Um, this was a, a report, uh, a paper that we reported at OFC this past year. And here, this is sort of the CAD drawing of it. Um, the idea is, again, we're going to directly drive from a CMOS chip that's designed for power efficiency and speed to uh, an array of electroabsorption modulators. We keep all the wire bonds very short to make that connection very clean. And then we looked at putting uh, bias uh, decoupling capacitors directly between. So this is actually the bias on the EA chip to ground on the IC chip, because this was, again, such a critical connection for us. Um, and this is kind of crude. This is a wire bond thing. This isn't a, a fancy flip chip package, but I think really hammers home the point that if you want to try and draw these new ways of, of driving devices and assembling things, you sort of have to think about how do I implement this in the real world and, and make it actually work. And this, this did actually work very well. I think we um, had this all running up at 32 gigabits per second, which was the fastest we'd done with sort of this family of, of drive circuits as well as um, these photonic devices. And really a lot of that was due to the way we packaged it. Um, that was followed up. This was also from OFC this past year. This was sort of the next turn of the crank on photonic integration. So this was a four-channel PIC, four lasers, four EA modulators, and with the same sort of driver approach. Um, so again, just showing uh, a nice level of integration and performance. This is four wavelengths into the same fiber. And if you break down the power, you, you can see that you really do reap the benefits. The modulation power is very, very low by eliminating these 50 ohm interfaces. It's really sort of the laser power that you're paying for, which you need to, to close the link anyway. So the next one uh, I wanted to mention is photonic switching. What was the energy This one, this was 10 picojoules per bit, transmitter only. So if you, if you look at it, it was, um, yeah, that, 1,100, and it was uh, 1,100 milliwatts and 28 gigabits per second. Or it was 1,200, I guess. Was it 1,200? It came out r right below 10 picojoules per bit. Uh, so optical switching, um, sort of broken down by the time scales that you can actuate switches. There's millisecond scale and microsecond scale and nanosecond scale. And these are all really supported by different technologies. And the, the faster you can make switches sort of opens up more applications. Uh, and I'll go through this in a minute. This is really just an overview slide that I'll come back to. In terms of hybrid networks, so this is the second picture that I sort of showed, which was change the network. So this is an overlay network where you have an electrical normal sort of cross-connect network, and you add this optical layer. 
And if you're interested in these kind of approaches, I would suggest you look up uh, Papin and Porter at UCSD. They've really been sort of driving this um, field, uh, you know, at least in terms of the academic world. Um, I wanted to mention Calient. Uh, we're in Santa Barbara, and in, in the context of photonic switching, usually Calient's brought up as well. We all know Calient, and they're kind of slow mem switches. It's an amazing piece of technology. I think we've sort of forgotten that now that it's actually out there and deploying products. But the fact that they can scale to these numbers of ports and, and low loss numbers is, is just an amazing thing. And so if you, again, want background, you can go to Calient's website, and they have a bunch of uh, white papers basically talking about these hybrid um, optical packet switch, or optical uh, circuit switch, electrical packet switch networks. So UCSD sort of progressed down the, the um, I guess, path of looking where, where does it make sense to insert these, at what level of the hierarchy does it make sense to insert these optical circuit switching technologies. The first they did was sort of at the top level, and this was with uh, the 3D MEMS, the Monkey Calient switch. Uh, and that was really because if, if you need to, if you need on the order of tens of micro, uh, milliseconds to reconfigure the switch, you don't want to be doing that very often. Um, and as you go down the switching hierarchy, basically the demands for reconfiguration become higher because your, your traffic is more granular as you, you move toward the servers. So over the past years, they sort of worked as, as with that as a starting point and have looked at what would it really take to get down to the top of rack switching level. And really, it's not surprising. They need fast reconfiguration, so you sort of need sub-microsecond scales. They need to have a lot of numbers of ports for that same reason I, I brought up earlier in terms of reaching more servers with a given switch. And they need to be some reasonable cost. So at IBM, for a long time, we worked on, on integration with switches and drivers. This is in a monolithic process. So it was a 90 nanometer CMOS-based process that had photonics enablement added to it. Um, and it was interesting to us because it really, if you looked at the features it would offer, four nanosecond reconfiguration times, this is turning the switch on and off, and a broad spectral bandwidth. And th there's a little bit of a bait and switch here. These are two by two mock switch, uh, mock sender switching elements that I'm showing the data for. But if you look at uh, 60 nanometers of bandwidth, you could pack, say, 32 channels at 200 gigabits. So you could route a really fat pipe in terms of a lot of numbers of wavelengths and do it very quickly. But the lessons that we learned out of this were really that the losses were too high. It was really sort of not feasible to build a, at least a scaled up large number of uh, port switch without doing something to compensate loss. And then really, this, this is actually a high level of integration. There's, there's full drive circuits driving the devices, but you really need a lot of feedback and control to manage crosstalk. So we really actually needed, I think, more electronics integration to even make the argument that it could be a viable switching technology. There's, uh, again, this is sort of just reference work. There's a great work being done at Berkeley. This is Ming Wu's group, and they've, they've managed to take their MEMS approaches, which are microsecond scale, which is, again, interesting from an application standpoint, and drive the loss down from something that looked like sort of a research curiosity to something that looks very real in just the course of a couple of years. So really cool stuff and, and worth checking out. Um, ben Yu at UC Davis, I think, has been one of the ones that's really been promoting AWGRs as a means of connecting systems. Here, the, the routing mechanism is wavelength, so you sort of have a prism that routes the, the wavelengths, and you, by changing the input wavelengths, you can change where they, they come out. But again, a high level of photonic integration and, and looking at what these can do in terms of impacting systems. Um, I'm going to go back to that point about integrating gain, because I think it's critical, even for any of these other sort of approaches. Uh, whatever you sort of choose for switching, when you look at building a link budget at today's speeds, there really isn't any extra loss that can be tolerated. And so if you sort of put anything in between the transmitter and receiver, you need to compensate for it. The approach that we chose, just it was more, um, maybe uh, there, there were good reasons to do this, but there, it was maybe somewhat of a limitation of available technology that, that drove this, was to flip chip SOA, so semiconductor optical amplifiers, into an active uh, switch. And the semiconductor optical amplifier would provide the gain. And there's publications on this. They're, they're sort of at the bottom of the slides. But this is really a mess. And I think all of us that worked on it, you can ask um, the people that are still actually driving it forward, it's not very scalable. If you have to think about flip chipping individual chiplets at very high levels of accuracy, so this is the required accuracy to get a, this is plus minus one micron to get 2 dB, uh, sorry, 1 dB of uh, plus, 1 dB of uh, insertion loss into the SOA. Um, requires plus minus one micron accuracy. 
so it's a, it's a mess in terms of what you need from the process to build um, even, even the components that can come together and sort of deliver that accuracy. And then if you think about scaling up to a large scale chip, it's, it's really not a path that you'd want to go down. Um, it, apart from just the switching themselves, there's also new electronic capabilities that are needed to enable photonic switching. So again, depending on the time scale, whether that's millisecond, microsecond, or nanosecond, sort of defines how much emphasis you have to put on this. But really, whenever you're going to configure a network, and, and so basically have an optical path and break it and establish a new optical path, you're going to have to relock all of your synchronization circuits and reestablish the timing information before valid data can get sent. And so this is referred to as CDR, clock data recovery. And when you're really into the sort of microsecond or nanosecond scale, you really need this, this capability of being able to do this in what's usually called burst mode. So you need to be able to acquire the, the clock and data timing um, and be able to ship bits very quickly. This was again a chip we did at IBM and reported this year. This was um, the first real time we, we had tried this. It's a 32 nanometer chip. This is the timing, which I, I won't really go through, but it, it basically starts out, starts hunting for the, the proper alignment between the, the clock and the, the data bits, and finds it in 31 nanoseconds and then just tracks. So then it just acts like a normal CDR, and if there's drifts in the, the clock, it tracks and samples the data properly. We were doing this because of uh, fast photonic routing and switching. Um, but really, I think this is something that if we're looking at photonic routing, needs more emphasis in the community. I don't think there's enough research in terms of burst mode capability. And sort of the secret why we really wanted to work on it, even apart from switching, is if you can do this, if you can turn links off and then turn them on on nanosecond scales, it really opens the door to power management at a level that we can't have now. So right now, when optical links are turned on in a system, they're always on because they can't be turned off. So if, if they don't have real data to transmit, they transmit dummy data. If you could turn things off when they're not needed and then turn them back on when they are needed, you could really make more efficient systems. So again, something to work on in the future. So this is the punchline, which is probably good. But the path forward, I think, on both of these fronts is really large-scale integration. Silicon photonics, um, again here I think I don't need to spend a lot of time on it, but it, it's got a lot of advantages. If you can really integrate photonics into large scale silicon platforms, you can reap the benefits of integration, process control, wafer level testing, all of the standard arguments, and it's really particularly suited for the data center. I think battling it out with Vixels at the very short reaches is, is probably not where its, its sweet spot is. But if you think about hundreds of meters or multi-kilometer links, supporting wavelength division, multiplexing efficiently and cheaply, and then offering, again, a high level of integration to, to offer all of the devices and functions that you need, it's got a lot of advantages. So I got this uh, courtesy of John Bowers. And I think, again, this is a slide that we don't have to talk about much here at UCSB. Um, heterogeneous integration is very interesting because I think, let me get jump to the next slide. Again, um, borrowed. But I, I added this because I think the, the reality is we don't just need a lot of devices. We don't need a lot of the very exact same devices. We need a lot of functions to try and pull off this large scale integration. And so being able to integrate multiple platforms and support the different functions that we'll need in this sort of highly converged electronic photonic um, world that we want to live in really has to have uh, the benefits of a lot of platforms. So I think that that is one of the really um, advantages that I, I like about this uh, approach. So just a couple of illustrations of large-scale integration. So for switching, this is sort of a vision of that, that switch that I showed from IBM all grown up. So this is 64 optical ports in, 64 optical ports out. And if you sort of just look at it from a topological standpoint, you have a, uh, multiple stages of switching. So you're going to need a lot of SOAs. You have a lot of waveguide crossings. And then you'll not a, need a lot of control electronics. So you need large-scale photonic integration for all the switching amplification and control. You need large-scale electronics integration for all the electronics. And then what I haven't given enough attention to today, but I think is absolutely critical, is how do we package these things? I think this is such an open question that needs to be addressed. But all of these photonic interfaces, these ha all have to be done with low loss, with low cost, and with, with manufacturability and reliability built in. Um, I, I said that I, di I didn't really like the flip chip approach, and I, I like this hybrid uh, or 3.5 on silicon approach. The good news is on the SOA front, this, I think, work again, kind of started at UCSB, but it's active around the globe. And so I think the prospects of getting a sort of baked in, monolith, a photonically monolithic SOA are, are very good for, for building larger scale switches. 
And then on the other front, the large-scale integration for photonics I.O. I, I think I've said this multiple times, but I'll say it again. It really must deliver system advantages for photonics to get pulled into packages and, and, and co-packaged very intimately with electronics. And what that translates into is it better be more bandwidth and less power for processors, better let you build bigger switches to enable flatter networks. And really, if, if you can do this, then I think these higher integration levels can be applied through multiple different applications to make you build better systems. Oops. Um, but again, this comes with a, a ton of challenges, which is ripe sort of uh, areas of research. Hundreds of these photonic interfaces, if you want to think about bringing all I.O. off optically, nat sort of naturally pushes you towards WDM and packing as much bandwidth for fiber or interface as you can. Doing this in a low-cost manner is very challenging. And again, there's, there's not a lot of room for loss. Loss translates into inefficiency and power and waste and things that we just can't afford anymore. And then the other part is really these thousands of electrical interfaces. If you think about it, it's, it's not just the optics coming off, but it's all the connections between the electronic chips. And even if it's a 3D chip, if the photonics is somehow on top of the 3D chip, we have to get away from being able to sort of draw a 50 ohm line between electronics and photonics and consider that whole I.O. as one sort of photonic element. And that's, that's what I really mean by photonic I.O. What that means is that these chip manufacturers have to commit fully to photonics. They basically can't design their standard cell macros that are so um, sort of heavyweight and hardcore that they can drive any backplane you throw at it because then when you add the photonics into the package, you don't have any sort of savings in power and you don't have any watts available to even give to the optics. You sort of have to fundamentally change how you design these things and it has to be in a process where you integrate from day one and fully committed the photonics into the package. And then the other sort of topic that gets, um, again, not as much attention as it should is reliability. If you do this, these photonic interfaces, they either can never fail, which is never going to happen, or they have to be very uh, effectively spared. And so I think that's another thing to really think about is how do you sort of build this thing and make sure that even if everything doesn't yield, you can still have a part that's capable and, and being um, you know, useful in a system, even if you don't have 100% yield. So large-scale integration, I think, is fundamentally required. And again, this, this whole thing has to be considered as a holistic problem. So that's really it. The closing thoughts are, I think we can really build more highly connected systems that can be routing a, a lot more bits more efficiently and really changing the way that we package and, and we construct things at the fundamental chip level. Um, and I think that's really an opportunity. And again, these, these sorts of drawings are great, and I hope that we can come through it as a field. Um, the point I wanted to make here is these don't actually all have to be the same photonic technology. Silicon photonics doesn't have to take over the world. Indium phosphide single mode doesn't have to go away. Vixels can live a healthy, long life. This really might be a mix of things that go into a chip module. You might have Vixels for top of rack to server interconnects, and you might have one type of single mode interconnect for photonically switched networks and a different one for point-to-point -point links. But this could be a highly optimized system, and it doesn't have to be sort of one technology fits all. But the challenge is how do we do this at a large scale? And I've, I've, I'll finish with this thought. As I've talked about the technical challenges to some degree, I think rethinking the manufacturability in the supply chain is, is of equal importance. So if you move from the, the electric, uh, electrical chip packaging sort of centric world that we're in now to something where there's so much photonic content, that really changes the game. So again, co-design is required, but then also how do you assemble this thing? We're in a chip centric world now because that piece of silicon is the most valuable part of it. If you really had sort of a, a cartoon package that looked like this and it had all of these photonic interconnects around it, what's more valuable? Is it the photonics or the electronics? And who's going to build that part? Is it really just the sort of contract manufacturing that we have now, or does it demand some sort of different model? And I think all those things are, are going to be interesting as we go forward. And that's it. So I, I think fun, at a low, uh, it took me forever to page back to it. At low data rates, the, uh, the equalization doesn't really buy you much. But in our experience, especially with CMOS, when you were right at the very limits of the capability of the process, so if, if I was barely, barely able to go 20 gigabits per second, sort of in that example that I showed, 
your penalty in terms of how much power you're having to put in to overcome bandwidth limitations is really the most fundamental thing, is you're really falling off a bandwidth cliff so that by just giving it that preemphasis and sort of fixing that fundamental bandwidth problem means you can turn things down more and, and sort of win from an efficiency standpoint. Because the actual preemphasis doesn't cost you a lot in terms of power. Yeah, I think it was 26. It's a Chalmers Vixel, um, and I think it was 26 gigahertz. Was the bandwidth? Was the bandwidth? And you actually have to use a lower band? Um, I'd have to go back and look. I think it was similar. I mean, I think it was driven hard. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember exactly what it looked like, but it was up in the 20s. Yeah. Well, and on the photodiode side too, the photodiode bandwidth is on the order of 30 gigahertz or so, which is again sort of an opportunity for silicon photonics. I think if you can make faster components. And also, not have to worry about all the nonlinearities of a Vixel. It should be easier to equalize a modulator than it is a Vixel. So, I think that's something good to work on. Other questions? Yeah, I don't know if you can add on to the simple or the Vixel with some uh, tension speed to project. Vixels are, yeah, I don't think there's a speed limit for Vixels that we found yet. That, that 71 gig link, the reason why it's 71 gig is because that was how fast the test equipment went. So I don't know. I th I th it's my expectation if you actually built in the multiplexers, and the MUX and DMUX in the electrical chips, I, I don't know that you can build a 100 gigabit Vixel link within the next couple of years. And these are NRZ too. That, that's the other part that sort of gets lost is, um, I didn't show the data here, but there are 50 gigabit NRZ Vixel links that are running with 10 dB of margin. And when that's the case, it sort of raises, well, why are we really sort of focused on PAM4 and these things for, for these really short reach interconnects if you can just do it with NRZ? To go back, maybe one of your conclusions by, so you had a bigger version of this, but so the front end, the left hand side, that's a four by. Oh, the, the, that's not that far back. That one? Okay. That's an optical four by four. And then it's a 16 by 16. No, these are all optical. They're Sorry, optical. yeah, all the switching is optical. And the only thing that, yeah. Uh, the code, the electronic IC is above there, which is. Uh, uh, oh yeah, well, and the shading is, is yeah. And I think it's been copied and pasted a few times. So you don't see it, but yeah, the electronic is really just the stuff at the bottom, and then the monolithic active photonics is really the switching, which is all those gray um, switching blocks. Thank you.